Uh, I want to apologize for last video. The audio quality was really bad because the mic was not in front of my face, almost as if uh, that's how that is supposed to work. Okay, so I want to talk about the mechanics of shorting. And to start, this will be about being the borrower. We'll get to the, the lender in a second. So there's a couple things that are at play here that need to be considered. Uh, I also want to, to state the quote by, by Jim, AKA Bam. He, he really opened my mind with this. Shorts are the shock absorbers of the market. Let's also remember that shorts make money on the way down. Pretty common, but I want to I want to make sure that that is clear even if you're new to this. So, for a a short to close out, they have to buy back. So, with with this quote in mind, right? And we invoke these two understandings, it makes sense that shorts are the natural shock absorbers of markets because when the stock is going down, that means that shorts are making money, which means that if it gets all the way down here, this is some point of profit for a short. So they will close out, meaning they buy back. which means that that will subsequently push the stock up to whatever degree. So shorts are a part of the market. It is a healthy part of the market when not exploited. You can say the same for, for going long, right? In the case of being exploited, that's why you see inflation at where it's at because people, not people, the Fed is allowed to buy junk bonds in copious amounts with no particular margin to adhere to at all. That's naked buying. So let's go ahead and, and dive a little bit further. We have cost to borrow. We have days to cover. And we'll talk about liquidity a little bit. Or slippage. Uh, this is the cost to borrow. Days to cover. So start with, with cost to borrow. We covered in the last video. If you're interested, please go check it out. The cost to borrow is an interest. It is some value that will erode through time. The cost to borrow is subject to price changes, liquidity, Uh, and some other minute factors, but these two are, are the primary ones. Oh, I guess demand. Demand to borrow. It's a market of its own is exactly how you have to think of it. So the cost to borrow is an ebb and flow. When prices start to go up, you will see the cost to borrow go up. This is for two reasons. One, other people are going to want to short, so your demand increases, which is this item down here. But also, the risk is going up. On top of that, those who are lending the shares might want to start getting them back. So instead of creating turbulence and forcing a share recall, they'll start to nudge the cost to borrow. So as the cost to borrow goes up, the payments on behalf of the borrower will also go up, right? It's a natural ebb and flow. It's a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful part of the market when you think about it. It's a very natural thing to see these types of mechanics actuate. Um, liquidity. This is multifaceted as well, but the point of liquidity is, is how easy is it to facilitate the flow of 
sourcing shares to lend, but also then to short into the markets. Because if the underlying is illiquid, then you will experience slippage between spreads. Right? So if, if your bid ask spread is, is, I don't know, 50 basis points, right? Sounds absurd, but look at Amazon or look at GameStop. Then every time you go to short, you're losing a, a significant amount in terms of volume to price slippage in between spreads. Your cost to borrow will eventually feel that ripple when it comes time to pony back up the shares, because especially if you're driving the price into an illiquid territory of the chart. Days to cover. How am I doing? Days to cover is important as well. Days to cover is important because it literally means how many days does it take to cover? You take some average volume over typically 30 days is an industry standard, sometimes 10, sometimes even just five. Um, you take this value, so your average daily volume over this interval, and um, uh, you divide this by your total short interest. I think I have that right. It might be the other way around. Uh, fuck me. Why can't I do math? Oh, fuck. Yeah, it'd be the other way around. Other way around. My brain just froze. So it's the other way around. So if you have 100 shares short with an average volume of 50, it would then take you two days to cover. This is the other way around. So this is important because this also will, will fall under the umbrella of liquidity, which is if you have a short position of 100 shares, right? Even just collectively, if everybody who held a short came out to 100 shares short, but the average volume is 50, then it would take you two days to exit that position. It would take you two days worth of transactions to entirely exit this position. This is important because of just liquidity. How, how malleable, how frictionless is a position and the requirements and responsibilities of having that position. So days to cover is already at two and a half on AMC and I think nearing three on GameStop. This is a big problem for anyone that has a position that has infinite unlimited loss. So now that we have those things established, liquidity comes in at third. Um, liquidity is, is a very monolithic term. There's a lot of ways that you can apply it. But liquidity is just how, how literally liquid is something. Uh, things that are of liquid have little to no friction. We attribute friction to things like spreads and any slippage that happens in between facilitating transactions. So liquidity is kind of this uh, overarching theme. Uh, so this can be your spreads. Uh, this can be volume. This can be the options chain. Right? It's very, very, very important. Uh, things like pawn shops exist for the sake of liquidity. If you have an exotic dildo that's made of wood, you paid $1,000 for it back in the day. There's no buyer of, of a wooden exotic antique dildo. Not at your disposal, at least. So you take it to a pawn shop and you get 500 for it. This 50% gap is minus $500 is your, your friction. This is, this is your, your measure of liquidity, or in this case, the lack thereof. What pawn shops then do 
is they sell it for instead of five hundred, they sell it for seven fifty. This is a twenty-five or fifty percent gain relative to the fifty percent loss that you took. Pawn shops exist as remedies to liquidity crises. My point of this, though, is that there is a market for illiquid anything, illiquid financial instruments, stupidly exotic and rather disgustingly sounding uh, sex toys, whatever it is. But this is also part of the market. And this is a key part of every transaction. People who take advantage of the spread. You want to sell it for a thousand, but you get five hundred. You want to buy it, uh, uh, whatever. You get the point. There is a market for this, and this is what market makers do. Except instead of these fifty percent differences, you know, it's it's a couple basis points. It's it's in between pennies. That's what market makers are. That's what Virtu is. That's what Citadel is. That's what all these big players are. This this is something that has to be understood throughout all of our markets. This is very, 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 very important. And any of these three pieces right here, price changes, liquidity, and the demand to borrow, all dictate the ebb and flow of being a short. I hope this helped. If it did, like, sub, fondle. Appreciate it. I'm out.